apologies for the slight delay. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that kind, generous introduction, um, and also for the privilege of joining an illustrious um, number of John Beveridge orators in being able to address you this evening. Uh, Elizabeth pointed out I served this hospital for a number of years, and I wish to, as a consequence of that, share with you some reflections of its history, uh, its wonderful culture of caring and some achievements. And I will also take a moment um, to use the progress of childhood cancer over the 50 years or so to illustrate some outstanding improvements. Finally, at this point, I'd like to thank all those people who have helped me with slides and photographs from the archives that has been extremely helpful. I'm very conscious that on this particular occasion, this oration is part of a broader series of celebrations of the campus as a whole, marking 50 years of teaching facilities of the university here. And in fact, our story begins with the appointment of John Beveridge to the Chair of Paediatrics at the University of New South Wales. The service initially was established at Prince Henry, Ephraim House, and you can see John showing, it seems to have been a, a constant pattern in the Children's Hospital, showing dignities through the place. And you will also notice the interesting uniforms of the nursing staff. <laughs> it wasn't too long later that the service expanded to the Randwick site. And initially in three of those huts that you can see, uh, if I can bring the point, well, it's not hard to see the huts from an aerial view. These huts were constructed in World War I for purely temporary accommodation. Um, and the paediatric service occupied three of those. There's another group of dignitaries being shown through by John uh, up Easy Street. I say up because they're walking uphill. Um, presumably away from having visited the children's ward back towards the main Prince of Wales Hospital. Interesting sign of the times, not only is the chimney of the laundry smoking, but at least two of the dignitaries you'll notice are smoking. I can only, I can only hope that they lit up after they left the children's ward. John continued to, to reign, to lead, to teach and inspire for some 28 years until 1990 and his retirement. John died in 1999 and Libby offered me the honour to speak at the memorial service and I can find no better words than to quote from the eulogy at I gave at the time, I remain forever grateful for John's leadership, mentorship and friendship. We named a number of things after John Beveridge. This photograph captures a number of those. Well, there were three in particular. The John Beveridge oration, and what you see there is the first John Beveridge orator, your Excellency Professor Mari Bashir. We're standing in, on the doorstep of the John Beveridge Lecture Theatre, and I at that point held the John Beveridge Chair of Paediatrics. The third person in that photograph we did not need, need to name, uh, Libby Cookson made that decision some half a century earlier to become a Beveridge. That photograph actually commemorates the opening of Founders Foyer just outside those doors. And that is a very important recognition of all the colleagues that joined John in those early days. John will be the first to tell you, you, you cannot do it alone. 
and he attracted and recruited wonderful colleagues, um, starting with those two giants of children's healthcare, W. Baring and Graham Morgan. He continued to recruit and expand medical nursing and allied staff of this establishment. And I'm, at this point, I must apologize for the selective nature of these photographs. We could not possibly do justice to all the, all the people who have served this organization brilliantly. And I am at least partly at the mercy of what the archives have turned up. However, in the book that Susie Rankin so lovingly compiled from tapes that John had left behind that he had generated from interviews with various colleagues and dictations. In that book, many of our colleagues are appropriately acknowledged and recognized, as illustrated by those four very important people there. By the time of John's retirement in 1990, the medical staff had grown to a modest but substantial number, captured in this group photograph taken immediately after that event. And you may recognize some earlier versions of the people in the room. <laughs> it's worth noting, however, that the service to children on this campus goes back to an earlier date. In 1870, the Catherine Hayes Hospital was established to care for the residents of the Institute of Destitute Children on Avoca Street back in 1870. But let me return to the 1960s and those illustrious, beautiful huts. They were modest, um, possibly Spartan, but they did service well. Office accommodation was extremely limited and working hours were very hard, so getting an occasional nap between calls was quite acceptable. You, you have to remember that this was an era where children spent a long time in hospital. It was an era where we had our own sewing room and our own laundry. And so it went until the 70s when it was the first occasion of building new purpose-built facilities, real bricks and mortar, at the western edge of what was then the Prince of Wales Hospital. And what this became was, as you, many of you will remember, the first construction of the Children's Hospital, a C-shaped building with a parking in the middle. You will still see the huts in the background, and they continue to be used for non-inpatient services for many years to follow. And you can also get, catch a glimpse of our first street frontage alongside that of Prince of Wales. I'm now fast forwarding to the mid 90s. The 90s, the decade following John Beveridge's retirement, was a turbulent and challenging time, but also turned up some amazing opportunities. This aerial photograph illustrates the complete redevelopment of the campus. In the middle, the hole in the ground is what will become the campus centre, Prince of Wales and Prince of Wales private hospitals. The Royal Hospital for Women is under construction to be relocated from Paddington. The Children's Hospital is getting the west wing, the east wing barely visible, as well as moving into the part of the emergency wing of the Prince of Wales Adult Hospital. All this was happening at the same time. The opportunity for the Children's Hospital, and this is the west wing you're seeing going up here, was at least partly driven by the relocation of the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children to the new Westmead site from Camperdown, where they had lived for some 89 years. This was uh, an enormous opportunity for growth. We almost doubled in size and increased our scope considerably. It was also an opportunity for organisational change. Up till this time, by whatever name, the paediatric service was, in governance terms, handled as a division of the Prince of Wales Hospital. 
At this point in time, we were given delegated autonomy, gazetted as a hospital, and embraced within the newly formed South East Sydney, South East Sydney Area Health Service, that, that, that particular iteration, <laughs> which has come back, except it's now not Area Health Service, but it's back to South East Sydney. Um, we proceeded to plan our new status and new organisational structure. And this snippet I found or excerpt from the workshop we held on February, in February 1995 does exemplify that process, a somewhat historic workshop. By 1997, the new campus had emerged. You can now see the campus centre with the Prince Wales Private at the top, the Women's Hospital, Hospital for Women, all wings of the Children's Hospital, um, in its relatively current state. For us, the concept of co-location with a range of adult facilities was a very important issue. I always have said that it is a delicate balance between the benefits of co-location and the importance of a degree of autonomy. For example, we had our own entrance quite distinct from the rest of the campus. We were on High Street, they were on Barker Street. We had a very distinct public profile, a very distinct role in the health system, and a very particular culture and ethos. But at the same time, we benefited enormously from a range of shared services, whether they were infrastructure or the efficiencies of critical mass, or indeed expertise. There were never, nevertheless numerous attempts to try and re-amalgamate or absorb. Most recently, as recent as 2005, a review recommended something along those lines. This expert, excerpt I found is from a response to that review, essentially arguing that we are very conscious of this balance, we think we've got it right, and we are supported in this belief by a national survey that was conducted. A very important, both symbolic and practical event, however, was the name change on the 1st of April 1996. And soon thereafter, it was tabled in Parliament. And really, Hansard sums it up beautifully. If I may just read the second paragraph. The Prince of Wales Children's Hospital was officially renamed and launched by the Premier on the 1st of April 1996 as the Sydney Children's Hospital to better reflect the role and responsibility of the hospital following the move of the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children to Westmead. So what kind of hospital have we grown into, <coughs> built on the shoulders of John Beveridge and the founders? Well, we do enormously value our separate entrance and our autonomy, but as a real children's hospital, we are all about children, and we do love to celebrate. In fact, we celebrate a lot. I'm pleased to hear that today was party day, is that correct? Today was party day? So it, the tradition continues, uh, and th that photograph, top left photograph, is from a party day, and I presume today was a lot of fun. We are not only superbly child-friendly, but exceptionally dedicated to the best care of children and their families. And you will observe in these photographs some changes in a nurse's uniform since the Prince Henry days. We understand that we need to care for families, and the flip side of that is we need to engage families as partners in care of their children. Around 2000, we took the extra step, progressed beyond that, and beyond engaging parents and families in the care of their own child, we asked them to help us design and deliver the best of services for all children, and that led to the birth of the Parent and Consumer Council. And I can see Lynn Peake at the back there, who moved on to become chair of that after I started it. And very soon thereafter, the participation by parents and consumers on hospital committees rose rapidly. We also understand or understood 
that the families we serve, just as the staff that work with us, come from a variety of diverse backgrounds. And we did a range of research projects to better understand and manage that reality. We were blessed by a series of distinguished visitors <laughs> and celebrities. But on a personal note, none more important <laughs> than the roosters. And here is a young Minicello who only a few weeks ago led his sight to grand final glory. We were very much and increasingly a statewide organisation with particular emphasis on the needs of children and families in rural and regional New South Wales. One data piece, I won't give you too many bits of data, to exemplify that is this collection of the clinics undertaken in the year 2007, some 1425 in number across the state. Just to give you a sense of one aspect of that commitment to outreach across New South Wales. We were masters of networking and partnership across all colleagues in the state and also, of course, with our children's hospitals colleagues, both at Westmead and John Hunter Children's and elsewhere. I've had the pleasure of working with three chief executives of initially Royal Alexandria and then Children's Hospital Westmead, John Yu, Kim Oates, who is the longest serving and is photographed here, and most recently Tony Penner. We were passionate educators uh, across a range of scenarios, disciplines, professional and community. And just to exemplify, the numbers of paediatric specialty trainees that we had annually was exceptionally high for our size, quite disproportionate. And their results in the exam were always at the top rank and always way above the national average. But nothing exemplifies this passion for education and continuing professional support than the annual course in paediatrics. Started in 1986 and initially, or 83 I think, 83, initially called the course for isolated paediatricians. It grew in popularity, stature and importance over the years thanks in no small part to John Ziegler here and more recently Chris Webber. This growth continued, in fact expanded, accelerated, to the extent that in recent years we've had to split it into two consecutive courses during the one week and it still continues to grow. It is the most sought after course in paediatrics in the country. We, are, we have been a very well-performing, high-performing organisation. We were never the biggest or the most famous in the world. Some have said, however, simply the best. But the, the importance here is that the key, the key message, the key issue about all those achievements is about the workforce, the exemplary dedicated, expert, caring workforce that we have had over the years. If there's one message that I'd like to leave with you out of this oration, it is my admiration, my gratitude and my public acknowledgement of all those people who have served here, continue to serve here and make this place what it is today. Now let me look at the evidence a bit, moving from the subjective to the more objective. There was a constant stream of letters, emails and calls <coughs> from grateful families and customers. There was, we had excellent press, we had a good relationship with the press. We had excellent community support. Complaints, adverse events and bad press were very rare. In fact, I cannot remember any bad press. I kept this Herald front page because it's kind of paradoxical, back in 1998, which you may not be able to see. The top half of the page attacks the health system for blowing the budget, and the bottom half of the page praises Sydney Children's Hospital for saving the life of a child. 
we, we, we did have, the, the press were good to us. The community were even better to us. Uh, there are many aspects of community support, but probably the most measurable was the financial. And this curve shows the increment in annual fundraising by the Sydney Children's Hospital Foundation over the years from 1997 to the current time. Quite an impressive rise. Exemplified by the photograph, which is the gold telethon, donors large and small across the community. The most recent and pinnacle of that generosity was the building and opening of the Ainsworth building. What we have here is the building, the opening event chaired by Elizabeth in the presence of a couple of ministers and other parliamentarians. And then you have, let me just move the pointer down here, a very happy Len. Um, in the back row, that's a $5 million man. Um, <laughs> Brian and Carl from Sargent, $1 million. Chris Chung from Coogee Bay, $1 million. And then over here we have a separate photograph of the Saunders family who donated $4 million to the mental health unit. And in the photograph we have Elizabeth and the chairman of the board, Christine Bennett, and also a guy called Joel, who's a friend of the family. Let me continue on this track towards objectivity and performance. There were several measures of staff engagement and teamwork, including research conducted locally, and I notice Jackie Crisp is here today, uh, but importantly statewide surveys which always placed this hospital at the top of all indices. And likewise for the New South Wales Health Consumer Survey, at the top of the indices that are measurable. Financial performance second to none, uh, the only place to be fairly consistently in the black. But the single most objective measure was the Best Hospital Award, designed by the New South Wales Government across a dashboard of key performance indicators for all the large hospitals in the state. And it only ran for three years. And Sydney Children's Hospital won two out of the three based on all those highly objective criteria. Let me now turn, as I said at the outset, to illustrate improvement over those 50 years through the progress in children's cancer. That curve documents an improvement from nearly zero survival to some 80% over those 50 years. I want to pay particular tribute to Darcy O'Gorman Hughes. Darcy founded, pioneered, inspired, led much of that improvement, not only for this hospital, but for the country as a whole. He embodied much of what is special about this hospital, the humanity of it. He died in the year 2000, and I haven't seen, but I understand some his sons and daughter were going to join us today. Here we are. Hey, guys. <laughs> Darcy meant a lot to me. He was a mentor and a, and a great leader to us all. Oh, I was going to say the other person in that photograph is Jane Murdoch, who was the much-loved nurse manager of the cancer ward, who also died at a very, very young age. Darcy inspired me, including the current leader of the team, uh, as we now as now called the Kids Cancer Centre, Glenn Marshall, an outstanding clinician scientist, a great achiever, and as you can see from that slide, continuing to fight the good fight. It's been a magnificent trajectory from Darcy to Glenn. So much so that Australia's figures for survival in childhood cancer are right at the top of the international scale.
keep in mind that the peak age of incidence of childhood cancer is around four. This, these data are from the publication, which was the first 1,000 patients treated at this site. And if you add to that the notion of 80% cure rates, the impact is a very large number of years of life saved. So much so that some one in 700 working age people currently are survivors of childhood cancer, a number that is growing. A shining light of the cancer service was the blood and marrow transplant program. Started in the 70s again by Marcus Valls. He couldn't make it tonight, we did speak. Um, he's actually away. Um, the photograph there with Mark Young, who in 1979 was the first and longest surviving bone marrow transplant recipient in the whole country. This service is studded with firsts and achievements from Marcus right until the present time when it's led by Tracy O'Brien. And it, it continues to attract enormous national and international recognition. The first cord blood transplant was undertaken here. The first cord blood bank was established here. And look at those numbers of transplants from cord stored here and all those research publications. Mark Young, incidentally, is currently a successful professional and family man in his 40s. We also pioneered a number of chemotherapy regimen. Uh, this publication exemplifies the first peer-reviewed report of chemotherapy effectively treating children, young children with brain tumours. And that was the product of both laboratory models and clinical trials. We're very proud of our survivors. And I should mention Richard Connor and Karen Johnson lead a very effective survivorship program which supports those ex-patients right through their adulthood and advocates for them. The other thing I should mention from this slide is if Michael Milton were to present today, he would not probably have an amputation. He would almost certainly have a limb salvage procedure. So the advances have been not only chemotherapy and transplantation, but also surgery and radiation therapy. One of the key successes of oncology and cancer treatment in childhood has been collaborative trials across multiple organisations. In the 1980s, we formed across Australia and New Zealand the Children's Cancer Study Group, and you may recognise some faces in that photograph, including the current dean, Peter Smith. But nothing, there's been many progressions and, and iterations of this, but nothing exemplifies that collaborative spirit better than the recently established Kids Cancer Alliance, which embraces not only the two sites of the Sydney Children's Hospital Network, but the John Hunter Children's their respective universities and, and the respective research institutes with a common dedication to translational research and best practice. Here are the leaders of today proudly following in the footsteps of Darcy and Marcus. Let me just exemplify with one set of outcomes that are that is so poignant. Uh, this study was part of a series of studies in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, all newly diagnosed patients. It took place over several years in centres that are now part of the Kids Cancer Alliance. But it hinges around this, this new, exquisitely sensitive diagnostic test developed at the Children's Cancer Institute, which picks up residual leukemia cells, many, many fold lower quantum than any other test we can think of. And the way this plays out, I just have two curves here. The top curve is a historic landmark study performed in Germany, which explains the language, uh, which recognized the stratification of leukemia patients into three risk groups, standard risk, medium risk, and high risk. And while standard and medium risk are doing OK, this is a survival curve along the years, the high risk drops right down to around 20%. With that diagnostic test, early in the piece, 
picking up patients before there was any clinical manifestations and shifting them into a highly intensive rescue regimen. Study 8 produced data, which is shown on the bottom half of that slide, with the high risk patients now having survivors in excess of 70%. I want to acknowledge the Children's Cancer Institute, which started as a small laboratory in Darcy's unit and has grown enormously and now have relocated down the hill to occupy a fair chunk of the Lowy Centre at the University. Their vision for the future, and I won't trouble you too much with details of this, but their vision for the future is to understand the genetic makeup using genomic technology of the patient and the tumour cell and having both these data sets to design treatment that is specific to that individual. It seems like science fiction, but it's not far away. Of course, comprehensive cancer care is more than science. There's a lot of humanity. Darcy taught us that. Families are engaged in so many ways. This is just one manifestation of that. And when we think about the needs of children comprehensively, it goes way beyond their actual treatment. This exemplifies the opportunity to reintegrate into the school environment after intensive treatment or absence from school. And yes, our cancer patients and survivors also know how to celebrate and embrace life. Let me now come back finally to the recent past and current status. Many of you will remember the Garling Inquiry in 2008, a um, fairly major piece of work. In fact, Peter Garling was our orator in 2009 and described the passion he had developed for children's health. He recognised opportunities for better coordination and prioritisation of children's services. The first and most visible manifestation of that was the, what I call, unification of the Children's Hospital at Westmead and Sydney Children's Hospital under a single governance structure. A very important step, and one that we had long considered to be good for children. Other things took longer. There was multiple iterations and consultations, but eventually, in late 2012, the Statutory Health Corporation New South Wales Kids and Families was established with the remit to coordinate both the health and the health care of children and families across the whole state of New South Wales. So what does the future hold? Well, I made mention of the CCIA vision. I think knowledge, science and technology will continue to grow exponentially. And the notion of genome-determined personalised medicine is not only for cancer, but for many other conditions. We are thinking across all of children's health and well-being here. But we are and will continue to be bedeviled by the social, behavioural and emotional dimensions of care, the obstacles in the, in the social, behavioural and emotional dimensions of care. Child abuse, the challenge of child abuse and neglect is persistent and serious, and I Notice Graham Vimpani was good enough to join us from Newcastle. Australian society is becoming increasingly inequitable. In fact, that's what I heard on the news on the way over here. We had a tradition of equity. It's much less so now. An increasing number of children and families are vulnerable. The social determinants of health and well-being will, are, will continue to be absolutely critical. This slide that Karen Zwee presented at the Grand Rounds just a few weeks ago has three key messages. One is that where you live has a lot to do with your health and access to health care. The second is that if you're indigenous, you are a particular disadvantage. And thirdly, what happens in those very early years of life has consistent, continuous and major impact on everything that happens to you thereafter, your health and well-being for the rest of your life. As Richard Matthews said to me quite recently, what we need is a public health paradigm. 
a collaborative effort. This is the era of networks of alliances and coalitions, and Sydney Children's Hospital is good at that, in fact, very good at that. Individual brilliance, whether personal or organisational, will always be admired, but collective impact is the way to make a difference, collaborative effort. I suggest that Sydney Children's Hospital can build on the proud tradition we have described, a tradition created through history and embedded in culture, to lead, to contribute and to partner. Partner with colleagues at Children's Hospital Westmead, partner with, partner with colleagues on the Ranwick Hospitals campus, across the state of New South Wales and everywhere, both in health and beyond. Any organisation or individual who shares that commitment to the health and well-being of children. And for my last slide, we often say, in fact I confess I often say, children first and foremost. What does that mean to you? To me, it means that no matter how complex, challenging and highly contested the world around us has become, we are here to serve the best interests of each and every child. That means not only addressing the needs of the child in front of you, the child you're caring for, the child you're looking after, but the health and well-being of all children, the population of children, and through them, the future of our society. Thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Angus Gray, the Chairman of the Medical Staff Council, and I'd, I'd like to thank Les for that presentation. If John Beveridge was the father of this place, I kind of like to think of you as a big brother, or not in that Orwellian term, but <laughs> in the best possible sense of that, of that term. And um, I think you exemplify the, the ethos and the culture of this place, which I think should continue um, despite the changes, because in the end that's the, what's the most important. Um, I'd like to, you to join me in thanking Les again, and then after that, Elizabeth has a, has a short announcement to make. Thank you again, Les. Thanks, Angus. And uh, I'm not going to stand in the way of drinks. Um, however, it's an interesting situation, Les is, because technically he still works for us here. I think I still pay for point one. And we've, we've grappled with the, the issue that he hasn't really retired and left us and he's still here. But his contribution, as identified, is remarkable um, to the organisation. As everybody knows, we have the magnificent new building out the back. And uh, thank you to the Foundation and to the State Government for their contribution and everyone involved. Some of you may not be aware, because um, the lift actually does go up to four floors, but there's three that are the primary floors. And through Les's persistence, as is my usual want for having worked with Les from, for many, many years, he's persistent. And he usually doesn't take no for an answer, I find. But that being said, it obviously pays dividends because through some um, good negotiation too, we managed to secure resources for a simulation and an education centre on the top of the building at level four, which we are in the process of finalising. What I actually would like to announce tonight is our intention to call it the Les White Education Centre. <laughs> on level four.